uh, it's appearing inside a functioning memory stable devices. A uh, talk will be given by Dr. John Paul Strachan. And uh, he has been within Stan Williams' lab for the last two years as a postdoctoral researcher. And before that, uh, he was with Stanford University for his PhD and got his uh, bachelor's degree from uh, MIT. So with that, let us welcome uh, Paul, John Paul. Yes. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Just a quick sound check, is this, is this audible? What about now? Just need to be closer. Thank you. Okay, how about now? All right, great. Okay, so um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, like you said, I'm working with uh, Stan. And um, for this talk, I'm going to kind of change gears a little bit and kind of zoom in on these memristors and try to do some kind of materials characterization of what's going on in these devices. So a quick outline of my talk. I'm going to first describe these titanium dioxide-based memristors, which is kind of our, one of our mainstay um, memristive devices that we're using in the lab. And I'll describe our current understanding for how they operate. Um, I'll then move on to my main topic, which is physically characterizing these devices. And I'm going to use x-rays and TEM to do so. And with these techniques, I'll describe the material nature of the conductive channels that we see, and of the on and off switching as we understand it. So I'll, I'll describe the resulting physical picture that we get and how we can use this to make better devices. Um, so here's, here's our devices. Um, here's a cross-section TEM of the uh, platinum dioxide platinum devices and here's an AFM of this crossbar device. Um, there's a number of publications in the last year from our group that are using these titanium dioxide based devices. So I'll describe some of this work, but I encourage you to, to get a full picture to look at all of them. And basically what we're seeing electrically is we have this very nice um, bipolar resistive switching uh, behavior that we see following this electroforming step right here. And um, as Stan described, we've got lots of nice properties. We've got very fast switching. This is scalable to very small dimensions, so we've got a very high density. This is non-volatile. And we've got a very large on-off ratio. Um, in terms of the physical behavior of what's going on, what, what kind of material changes are leading to this dramatic resistance changes? There's a lot of physical models that have been suggested to describe this switching. And if you look in the literature today, people are still publishing all sorts of different um, ideas for, to describe that. And so my approach is to try to use some direct materials evidence to try to pin one of these down. Um, before I go into my materials characterization, I really want to set the context for this work. So there's actually quite a few of us in the group that have been trying to figure it uh, figure this problem out for a while. And uh, to give you the proper context and tell a complete story, I'm just going to show one slide of a few techniques and the contribu contribution to the picture. And so first, this is some work done by my colleague Feng Miao. And to get the full story, you can look at his publications. What he basically did is he took our device and he applied a small bias and measured the current running through it. Simultaneously, he scanned an AFM. And when he did that, and looked at the conductivity that he measured, he saw that as the AFM goes over a, a spot in the device, he saw the conductivity suddenly spike up. And he saw this on a large device, and he also saw this on this nanoscale device. In fact, this conductive spot is about the size of the device itself, as Stan alluded to. Um, and this, is kind of, this was one of the earliest pieces of evidence that we have that um, the conductance is actually carried by a localized region within the device. And, you can read the details in Fang's paper, but he basically suggests that what, we've ha what we have happening is we've got a conductive channel running through the switching layer, and that as you come, up, come upon it with the AFM, with just a little bit of pressure, this conductivity is spiking up. And so in a sense, he's measuring the size of this conductive channel right here. Another piece of work that was done in the group um, by Julian Borghetti in this publication, what Julian did is he actually looked at the temperature dependence of the electrical measurements of the device. And so as you see here, he's actually looking at an on-state device, an off-state device, and this intermediate curve right here. And he looked at the temperature dependence of these IV curves as well. And if we start here in the on-state, he sees a fairly linear um, 
on state and a temperature dependence which is con consistent with a metallic um, conduction. So it's more resistive at room temperature. And um, if you then move on to this off state, we have this highly nonlinear rectifying IV. And so if you try to model this, it's no longer, of course, just a pure resistor. But you see at high bias, and you see this in this curve right here, F, you look at the differential resistance as a function of bias in all of these different states. At high enough bias, these guys are all saturating at a resistance of about 23 ohms, as he's shown here. So basically, if you apply strong enough bias, all of these guys are getting into a linear regime, a linear resistive regime, and it also has the metallic uh, transport conduction properties here. So again, um, uh, more resistive at room temperature compared to lower temperatures. And so to get the full story, you've got to read Julian's paper. But the basic model he's getting just from these electrical measurements is that if you wanted to model what the device looked like, the best picture was to view it as a big series resistor, a metallic conduction region, um, in series with two different cases. In the off state, it's in series with some kind of barrier transport. And in the on state, it's in series with another metallic resistor. And so this is, what, this is the picture that Julian got um, that he could grab just looking at these IV data. The next step, and Stan actually described this, but um, I think repetition is good, especially with nice work like this. Matthew then applied this dynamical stress test in which he's applying the sequence of pulses, as Stan described, and then probing it in between the pulses to measure the state. And if you look at the IV that he measures as a function of the duration of the stress, and that's what we are plotting here in the x-axis, he saw that he could best model this um, IV with a Simmons tunneling equation. And the Simmons tunneling equation has this parameter W, which is the tunnel barrier width. And he saw that um, if you look at the dynamical uh, stressing of the device, this tunnel barrier, when you're doing off switching, we can see this tunnel barrier moving from about 1.2 nanometers to about 1.8 nanometers. And when you're switching it on, you're reducing that tunnel barrier um, in the other direction from 1.8 to 1.4. And of course, as Stan pointed out, as you apply an, a, a higher external bias, you're getting there a lot faster. And so again, Matthew got a very similar model. And, and of course, all of this work is happening in parallel, I should emphasize. So we're all kind of developing these models based on results, and they're kind of confirming each other. And so what basically Matthew is seeing is that he's, again, modeling his data as this series resistor with, um, in series with a tunnel barrier. And that in the case of on and off switching, the dynamics that's occurring is actually the modulation of this tunnel barrier width. And he sees that it's moving by less than one nanometer. Okay, so this kind of motivated um, my work. And this is, of course, going on in parallel with this work that I just described. And my approach has been to try to look directly inside our memristive devices. And so here's our memristors. We've got this bottom electrode, um, this uh, blanket tie oxide layer, and then a pattern top electrode. And the junction is this right here. And my goal was to actually try to figure out what's going on inside, physically, inside these devices. So there's a number of challenges you can already expect. First of all, we're going to need a good, a high spatial resolution technique, because as we've already alluded to, we expect these conducting channels to be in the nano scale. We also want to have elemental sensitivity. We want to be able to distinguish what's occurring in the switching layer from what's occurring in the electrode material. This is to kind of distinguish from a lot of the theories out there that are just positing that electrode material is just migrating through your device. We want to know the chemical state of the switching layer, so we want chemical sensitivity. And the goal here is to do a non-destructive uh, measurement. We want to be able to measure it and then continue to electrically address it. And so if you want to be able to do that non-destructive, you're going to have to probe below, uh, you're going to have to try to probe below the electrode and see this buried switching layer. So the approach that I took is to actually use focused x-rays and electrons to look at our device. And um, I think in the case of electrons, most people are familiar with these techniques, like TEM and so on. And so I'm going to give a quick refresher on, um, on uh, how we can do this with x-rays. And so what I'm basically doing is I'm performing x-ray absorption spectroscopy on our tie oxide layer. And the experiment is rather simple. I'm basically taking my sample and shining x-rays on it and measuring the amount of absorption I have. Now, in the case of um, this X-ray absorption, the physical process that I'm exciting, in the case of, let's say, titanium, uh, any kind of transition metal oxide, if we're looking at the, what's called the L absorption edge, the excitation that we're doing is we're taking a core level electron and exciting it to these unfilled valence states. And so let me quickly show you what kind of data you get from that. So in the case of a pure titanium metal, 
Um, if you tune to this titanium L absorption edge, what you see is two broad absorption peaks. And those two absorption peaks are actually completely due to the core level. A, set, a splitting, this is just a spin orbit splitting of the 2p core level. And so that leads to two different absorption peaks. Um, first at lower energy, this L3 transition, and then at higher energy, this L2 transition. So now what happens if you actually move away from titanium metal and we now put oxygen into the mix. And so these titanium atoms are now bonding with the oxygen around them. And what happens is that these two broad peaks actually split. And that's due to a change in the density of state in these valence bonding orbitals. And so instead of these two broad peaks, what you start to see is what's called the crystal field splitting and you get four peaks. And as we go to the fully stoichiometric titanium dioxide, you can see a very pronounced crystal field splitting four um, um, distinct peaks. And beyond that, we can actually, not just the chemical information, we can actually get structural information. It turns out that the spectrum I'm showing you there is, corresponds to the um, anatase phase of titanium dioxide. So what I w want you to get from this is that basically by doing X-ray absorption spectroscopy and looking at the absorption curve, it serves as a fingerprint for what kind of material we have there. So to reiterate, we've got, with X-ray absorption spectroscopy, we can isolate the material we're interested in studying just by tuning this energy to the absorption edge of the material we want to look at. We can then determine the chemical and structural state by the shape of that curve. Now, next step is to get um, spatial resolution. So there are several ways to do X-ray microscopy. The technique that, I'm, that I use, and I've been using quite a bit, is uh, called STIXM, Scanning Transmission X-ray Microscope. And I actually used one right over here in the Advanced Light Source <coughs> Berkeley Lab. And the basic technique is we come in with monochromatic X-rays. We focus them using what's called the zone plate. We're able to focus these X-rays to a spot right on our sample, measure it in transmission, so we have a point detector on the other side. And now to get an X-ray absorption <coughs> image, we just scan the sample around. Uh, raster scan the sample and we acquire image. Now for this um, particular technique, the spatial resolution is set by how good your zone plate and um, the, the, the capability of this beamline is we've got about a 35 nanometer spatial resolution. The record is maybe on the order of 20 nanometers. So this is pretty close to um, one of the best that you can do. Okay, here's a quick image of uh, what the Stixum chamber looks like. I've spent a lot of time in front of this guy. And if you look inside the Stixum chamber, here's what I described. We've got our x-rays coming from right here. Here's my sample, and we've got a detector here. Um, and this sample stage then moves to scan and take complete images. To make devices for transmission measurements, um, both x-ray absorption and TEM, um, I fabricated these devices on silicon nitride windows to minimize the absorption um, through the substrate. And so this is a uh, kind of schematic of the device itself. Again, we've got our pattern bottom electrode, blanket oxide layer, a pattern top electrode. And this is now in this top view, you can see that this, um, this top and bottom electrode intersect right here along the silicon nitride window. And so this is where we're going to look at the device. Okay, so I fabricated a device like that. I then looked at its electrical switching behavior and saw very nice on-off switching, very similar to what we've, um, Stan has shown, basically very similar to the standard devices that we fabricate that are not on Windows. So this was very encouraging. I basically took this device, I don't show you here, but I had an electroforming step, and then I cycled it a number of times, um, repeatable off-on switching. Next step was to load it into the Stixum, and that's what I'm showing here, is an actual X-ray absorption image taken in Stixum of the device. So you can see this is the bottom electrode, this is the top electrode, and we've got our junction right here. And already within this junction, you can see some contrast within it. Now, the nice thing about doing this with an X-ray microscope is I can actually take images like this at a whole sequence of energies, and in that way, get a whole spectrum. And so that's what I'm going to show you here very quickly. We've got three different regions of the device, and I'm showing you the corresponding X-ray absorption spectrum um, for those regions of the device. And you can already qualitatively see a very kind of significant difference in shape among these different curves. And it's a lot of work to actually understand this, so I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but you can um, look at our papers and in the literature. We spent a lot of time um, actually growing reference layers to understand this. And starting with this um, region shown here outside of the junction, we're able to identify this spectrum as corresponding to the amorphous state of the dioxide. And this is actually how we grow the layers. It's actually in an amorphous phase as we grow it. Um, <coughs> If you look now within the junction, this spectrum shown here in red, you can actually see a, a, a distinct sharpening of these absorption peaks and this splitting of the second peak as evidenced right here. Now this turns out to be 
a perfect example from the literature, from our own measurements, of the anatase phase of the titanium dioxide. And so what we have here is that within this junction region, the initially amorphous dioxide has actually been heated up sufficiently to go into this polycrystalline phase, specifically the anatase phase. And it turns out that this actually occurs at about 350 degrees Celsius. And so we've heated up in this region the dioxide substantially. Now finally, this spectrum shown here in blue really is distinct from the other two, and I've already given you a clue as to how to interpret it. We, we can see that instead of this um, four peaks, we're moving more in the direction of these two um, metallic-like absorption peaks. And as this is, this is from the literature, other measurements where they went from dioxide to titanium metal, and they have the exact same feature. Another, another key uh, data point is this right here, about 456 EV, we get this low energy peak. And this corresponds to a titanium plus three valence state. So in the in stoichiometric dioxide, it's actually in a plus four valence state. The, um, the fact that we've got a large Ti plus three contribution shows us that we're in a reduced dioxide phase. So we're in an oxygen poor region shown right here. Okay, so as I mentioned, we've got an entire spectrum corresponding to every pixel in this image. So we can actually use that to do a full mapping of the device and tell you what the chemistry and structure is across the device. And so that's what I've done for you here. Um, in the green color, I'm showing the amorphous dioxide, so that's all outside of the junction. Within the junction, we've got this anatase phase that shows that heating has occurred in this region. In fact, you can see that it's not just in the junction, but it extends all along this bottom electrode. Um, we, we're pretty sure that that's because the bottom electrode is actually thinner, so more resistive, and so we just have dual heating, heating up this um, bottom electrode and the dioxide on top of it. And then, and then we see this blue spot right in the middle of the junction, which corresponds to this reduced phase of the dioxide. The next thing we can do is take this exact same sample and load it into a TEM and now do a selected area electron diffraction within this device. So we did that, and what we see is that if you look at this region outside of the junction, we can confirm that we got a diffraction pattern consistent with amorphous. Inside the junction, we see these nice polycrystalline diffraction rings, and they actually correspond, you can can match all of these rings to either the anatase phase of dioxide or the platinum due to the electrodes. And kind of of the most interest is if we look at the diffraction right here inside this reduced spot, what we see is a very prominent diffraction pattern, and this corresponds to a single crystal diffraction. And so we can take some time to actually index the sequence of, of, of diffraction um, spots. Again, giving, this also gives a fingerprint of the material. And what we learn is that this actually corresponds to a single crystal of Ti407. So as you, for those of you who are good at fractions, you can write it, well, you see that Ti407 is a suboxide of TiO2. We've gotten rid of some oxygen generated oxygen vacancies. If we take a dark field image of this Ti407 crystallite, you can see it right here. It's a very small crystallite, less than 100 nanometers. And so this crystallite is embedded somewhere in the center of this overall reduced region, which is a few hundred nanometers big. And to tell you a little bit about TI-407, it turns out it's, it's got a name, it's part of a whole family of um, stable structures of stable suboxides called the Magnelli phases. And interesting for us, it's metallic at room temperature, so very good, um, very good candidate for our, our uh, metallic conductor in our device. If you want to think about the structure, you can basically think of it as TiO2 with a sequence of regular planes of oxygen vacancies. More, more precisely, it's a rutile um, form of dioxide in which you've got these rutile slabs separated by a se sequence of regular stacking fault planes, and these stacking fault planes have a corundum-like structure. Okay, I want to also point out that we're, kind of, we're very interested to see that we're not the only ones who have seen this Magnelli phase. This is completely independent work. Um, none of us knew what the other person was doing, but this is actually hasn't even been published yet. But this is another group at Seoul National University, and this is presumably going to pu be published soon. It's available online in Nature Nanotechnology. And they also were looking at platinum titanium dioxide platinum devices, as shown here. They had really large devices. Um, I think they were hundreds of microns big. What they basically did was they uh, operated the device, they electrically switched it, and then they cut out... An what they thought might be an interesting region of the device and did cross-section TEM. And so in their devices, they do some high-resolution TEM. They also do selected area electron diffraction. And they're able to image these... They also were able from the diffraction to identify it as a TI-407 phase 
in these small conductive nanochannels. And so here's their nice images of these ti 7 um, structures. And so this is completely independent from us. Um, it's kind of nice to see confirmation, but of course it takes a little of our thunder away. Um, okay, so two groups. We've seen the same kind of this reduced suboxide um, occurring in our devices. Now, as I mentioned, I loaded in a device that had been cycled and formed already. So you might, want to want, you might wonder, when did this conductive channel actually form? So to actually investigate that, I did um, some preliminary measurements where I tried to do in situ switching. Again, this is what's nice about this technique is that it's non-destructive, so I can probe it and then electrically change it at the same time while it's in Stixum. So just wire bonded the device loaded into Stixum. Um, here's, a virgin here's an image of the device in the virgin state. Um, only small IVs um, have, been pro have probed the device and it's highly resistive. First thing I did was go ahead now and electroform the device. So we see this significant increase in the conductivity. And inside Stixum, we see this feature develop right here at, near the top side of the device. And if I kind of zoom in on that and do some subtraction of images to bring out the titanium plus three contribution, I can map out this conductive channel. And so you can see this right here. We've got about 125 nanometer conductive channel after the electroforming in the off state. Next thing is let's go ahead and switch this device now on. So you, again, you see this dramatic change in the conductivity due to on switching. And if I now look at it in Stixum, I see no changes throughout the device. Believe me, I looked very carefully. And uh, if I again zoom in on this conductive channel, I also don't see any measurable changes in the size of this channel. So to put those side by side for you, here's the device in the off state, this conductive channel, and here's the device then in the subsequent on state. And within the uh, spatial resolution of this technique, I see no change in the size of this channel. I see no other features developing anywhere in the device yet I have this dramatic change in the conductivity. Okay, so let me put this all together, including the work that I described by my colleagues. All of this kind of meshes together to give us a nice picture of what's going on. So first of all, I again am left with this picture that we have this localized conductive channel um, within our device, metallic-like. And what I was able to do is identify it directly to be a TI-407 suboxide. Um, so for the first time, we've got very direct evidence for the creation of these oxygen vacancies in our device. And one big surprise is that we actually saw that it's not just a random concentration of vacancies. We actually have this long-range ordering of the vacancies. Now, in the case of on-off switching, as I showed you, I saw no change, at least in the lateral area of the channel. I didn't see it growing. This is, of course, now a side view of the device. I saw no growth in this dimension of the device. Yet we've had this dramatic change in the conductivity. So consistent with what this modeling that we've done um, that I showed in the earlier slides, this is very consistent with the changes between on and off switching being a very small modulation of an insulating gap. And so we can even say a little bit more. We can imagine that this, um, as I mentioned, in the off state, it's not a complete, it's, this uh, conductive channel is not completely shorting uh, across the electrodes. We have, just from the electrical measurements that I showed you on this device, we have some insulating barrier in there. And so what we can now identify is that what we have is a conductive channel in series with this insulating dioxide barrier. And um, in order to switch it on and off, what we're basically doing is doing an electric field driven modulation of this boundary between these two phases. And of course, the oxygen vacancies are charged, so we can move these vacancies around. And heating might also, I should add, um, heating is also probably contributing to uh, um, uh, to enhancing the switching. Okay, I want to give you a, a quick slide um, on how we can actually use these results to make better devices. And this is work done by my colleague, Jinhua Yang, really talented material scientist in our group. And basically we said, well, if electroforming, all that it's doing is creating this large um, conductive channel in the device, then we can eliminate electroforming by just growing our devices deliberately that way from the beginning. And so that's exactly what Jinhua did. He used a TI-407 a target and deposited about 35 nanometers, a thick suboxide layer. He then grew a very thin, using a dioxide um, stoichiometric target, a very thin dioxide layer. And looking at the electrical properties, he got very nice, um, very nice switching. No electroforming step was required. Um, this this off state is identical to the virgin state of the device, and he sees very nice and very promising switching. So uh, basically, with that, I'd like to conclude. Um, we're able to do non-destructive measurements of these devices. 
um, using X-ray spectro microscopy, we're able to show within the, this device we have localized heating occurring, heating the device at least to 330 degrees Celsius. We have this localized channel of dioxide, which is a suboxide, um, localized within the device. With TEM, we're able to further identify that suboxide to be specifically the TI-407 Magnelli phase. And we saw that this channel in another device is actually created during the electroforming step. And in the case of on-off switching, we don't see any material changes in the device. And so we suggest that the picture that we have is, again, this idea that we've got a small modulation of this conductive channel. And in this case, we therefore can identify this um, as the phase boundary between the TI-407 and ti 2 um, So I'd like to acknowledge my coworkers, the HP team. And also, I really want to, especially being here at Berkeley, I want to identify um, uh, my collaborators at the Advanced Light Source for the X-ray measurements, David Kilcoin and Andrea Scholl. And then for the TEM measurements, right here at the molecular foundry, Shaw Aloni. So thank you for your time. So we have a time for a couple of questions, if you have any. Is there any question? Yes, in the back. Yes. yes. Uh, so two questions. So first, uh, here is the very last nice part on all the media the program the device. So I assume it's done with a small scale device with much smaller current. So I just want to kind of the mechanism are the same. Yeah, no, that's an excellent... The second one okay. is that, um, that if the mechanism are the same, then the formation of this crystal phase will this limit the staging of the device. Right? Because it will be some size, quite a critical size. Can you repeat the question? Okay. So his first question was relating to the fact that we, um, I was looking at, I should clarify, I was looking at larger devices here. So he's asking, what will this apply to the smaller devices, for example, the ones that Stan showed? So um, first, the reason why I look at these large devices is basically by the spatial resolution limitation of the techniques. Uh, 35 nanometers for the smallest devices we can make, that's one spot. So we're not going to get much um, spatial information from that. Nonetheless, um, I can justify looking at these larger devices. As Stan showed side by side, the, the micro scale devices and the nano scale devices, we see very similar IV curves. We see very similar dynamics occurring. So that gives us a really strong impression that the physics occurring in both cases is identical. And so therefore, it's helpful to go ahead and look at these micro scale devices and it'll apply. And then I think your second question was, well, what does this mean to the scalability? Well, I mean, the, the proof is in the pudding. We can already make these devices and they operate fine. Um, as small as we've been able to make them, and as Stan pointed out, they actually function better. And this physical description that I've given is not at all, um, uh, is not at all in contradiction to that. Um, we can have nanocrystals formed there, and maybe this device will actually switch, even if it's not in a crystalline phase, but you just have this suboxide phase. It doesn't necessarily have to have this large, long-range order, but perhaps if you've got this, in fact, the, the Seoul National University work that I showed, those were actually, they saw channels as small as three or five nanometers big. So, and these were already, these were in this TI-407 phase. So as far as we can tell, there's no scaling problems with this physical mechanism. One more question, yes. Do you have any speculation what induces the crystallization like in different films that formed in different spots? Uh, what does uh, create that? Are you talking about the TF-407 crystal or the anatase? Uh, the TI-407. Uh, <laughs> well, so basically, um, and there's a number of papers that have investigated the thermodynamics of these suboxide phases. They're highly thermodynamically stable. So basically, essentially, if you create enough oxygen vacancies in TiO2, they will actually thermodynamically favor to move into these crystalline phases, these, but, but these Magnelli the phases. Of it in the field. I'm sorry? The position of it in the field. Why did it occur in that spatial position? Yeah, it changes. You know, is there something inducing that uh, in the original uh, interface? Or... Oh, I see. Well, so I think, let me make sure I understand your question. You're basically asking, why did this channel form right here instead of right here? Is yeah. that what you're asking? Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, there could be several causes for that. Field enhancement at certain regions, so the topography might not be completely uniform, and so you actually have an enhancement of the field here. Because remember, what's happening first is electrochemistry is going on, 
We're actually creating these oxygen vacancies, and, um, and this is electrochemistry. And so this is going to be electric field enhanced. It's going to be thermally enhanced. There's going to be feedback between the two. And so if you've got any spot um, with some kind of topographical uh, features, that might be where it forms. As I showed you in another device, um, we had actually channels. I showed you another device over here where we actually had this channel formed near the top of the device. So we see some variability in that. There doesn't seem to be too much of a systematic preference for where it forms. So we think it probably is induced probably in the manufacturing step itself. Some kind of favored spot is, uh, is non-homogeneity initially there. So. so thank you very much. So hopefully you can continue the dialogue. <laughs> so we have